Samuel chapter 17. This evening we're going to follow along the same lines of the message this morning. We want to talk to you a little bit more about the eagle tonight. Uh, but tonight I want to uh, use a story by way of illustration. Once again, folks, I'm not giving you anything that's mine tonight. I'm giving you something from the evangelist uh, Bobby Thompson uh, from his wisdom and studying of the eagles, and it's been a blessing. I got blessed again this evening. And I'm telling you what, uh, I've studied this message, I've listened to it, and I've studied it, and I've looked at it, and every time I get into it, I just get all excited and slobbery and ready to take a fit, and, and I just start thinking about it, and it just it almost gets me to jumping, and uh, I hope it'll do the same to you tonight. Second Samuel chapter 17. Let's stand as we read the Word of God together, beginning in verse 15. Only three verses tonight, 15, 16, and 22. 2 Samuel 17 and verse 15, Then said Hushai unto Zodak and to Abathar the priest, Thus and thus did Abathel counsel Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and thus have I counseled. Now therefore send quickly and tell David, saying, Lodge not this night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily pass over, lest the king be swallowed up and all the people that are with him. Then to verse 22, then David arose and all the people that were with him and they passed over Jordan. By the morning light there lacked not one of them that was not gone over Jordan. Father, we come before you once again this evening grateful and thankful, but yet, Lord, knowing totally how, how we are leaning upon you tonight. Lord, there's no way in this world that this message can be brought without your hand. God, speak to us tonight. Oh, God, stir our hearts as never before. God, excite us. Help us to see, Lord, the, the awesome responsibility as a Christian. And God, help us to live accordingly. Father, Holy Spirit, we pray tonight that you'll convict hearts and souls right here in our presence. Someone that's unsaved, oh, God, we plead the blood of Jesus in mercy and, and, and in, in almost in, in scared fright tonight. God, I beg that you save that person. And, Father, for that Christian that's out of your will and in that wilderness, oh, God, in heaven's name, touch that person and bring them out of there. Give them victory. Now, God, have your way. Speak to us. We rebuke the devil. And, God, we pray for victory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. <clears throat> so I told you this morning the eagles live to be oh, anywhere from oh, 90 to 127, 30 years old. Those are our years. They they just run concurrently with human years. The eagle lives to be a beautiful bird, uh, an old bird. The older the bird gets, the prettier he gets, the stronger he gets, and the wiser he gets. But uh, something strange takes place with that eagle uh, around about between 30 and 35 years of age. I just touched on that this morning. We don't know what it is. Uh, Brother Thompson said he didn't know. Uh, he studied the eagle for over five years in Australia, Africa, all over the United States, all over the West. Uh, he studied the eagle, spent hundreds of dollars, a lot of time, a lot of devotion, and he doesn't know why that the eagle goes into this wilderness period in his life, but all eagles go into that for some reason or other. Many of them, many of them die in that wilderness. Let me tell a story tonight, and then along those, that storyline, uh, I want to develop the message, if I may. But in Cherokee, North Carolina, and I'm just going to say this, if I get an opportunity uh, this next spring to go to Cherokee, North Carolina, I'm going to look this Indian up. If, if there's any way at all to find the Cherokee Indian, Tacoma, I'm going to hunt him up. I want to talk to him. Uh, true story, Tacoma, Cherokee Indian over uh, just out of Cherokee, North Carolina, uh, and he was in, in a meeting with Brother Thompson, and he told him... He said, uh, Brother Thompson, I want to take it and show you something in the morning about the eagle. And Brother Thompson said, I want to go. I want to see it. So he went to uh, Tacoma, came and picked him up the next morning at 5 a.m. and started to cross the mountain, the Great Smoky Mountains coming from Cherokee back into North Carolina. And, and those of you that's lived in this area, you've probably been across that 441 more times than you care to count. But he was coming across that mountain and he turned off to the left and went back in one of those little old roads going back through there. And uh, he's in a four-wheel drive Jeep. This has been several years ago. 
and they went back in as far as they could go and turned off another trail and went as far as they could go and then they just turned right down the mountain and went down into a holler back in those great Smoky Mountain National Park. And Tacoma told a preacher, he said, now preacher, you're going to have to walk, so have your shoes on that you can walk. And they walked on even farther back into the mountains and, and Brother Thompson said he didn't know if he was ever going to get out of there or not. And they went back in there and he said, all of a sudden Tacoma told him to be still. And he said they began to look around and he said directly there was about five or six or seven giant seven and a half foot wing spread eagles sailing around overhead. And he said they were just, just flying around. And he said they stood there and they watched those eagles and said they noticed they had something in their talons and they didn't know what it was. They were high enough they couldn't see. And he said every once in a while one of those eagles would scream right at the top of its voice and said just run cold chills all over you. And said they watched him as they just flew or sailed around in the air currents up there. Finally Tacoma told him, he said, he said, preacher, he said, this isn't what I want you to see. He said, we've got to go a little bit farther. And he said they walked on off that mountain down into that ravine and he said as they got to the bottom there, he said, preacher, look. And said he pointed over under the, under the wilderness uh, uh, terrain there, under the pines and under the forest foliage, there on the ground were five eagles. And those eagles were, were full grown, 30, 35 years old. And those eagles were there and, and their, their beaks was chalked over. Their, their nostrils were almost sealed closed with the chalk. Their legs were swollen to where they could, could barely walk. Their talons had grown out and were very, very brittle. And they were of no use at all to the eagle. The eagle's speed had, had decreased now. These had even decreased lower than this, but to at least 37 miles an hour from 147 miles an hour. So these eagles were grounded. And they were so weak, they couldn't hold their head up. And the preacher said that as he looked at those eagles, he said two or three of them were there and he said their heads had already fallen over on their breast and they were just barely able to stand up there. And he said something came across him and he said it was a most pitiful sight to look at. He said as he looked at those eagles, he said they were having a real pity party. He said they were in a moping stage and they were right at the point of death. And old Tacoma looked at him and, and he said, he said, Preacher, he said, you know what's wrong with those eagles? And Brother Thompson said, no, I don't know what's wrong with them. And he said, Preacher, they've been in the wilderness too long. He said, Preacher, they just stayed here too long. He said they came down for some unknown reason and he said they sat down on the ground and he said they just got accustomed to the ground and he said God didn't intend for that eagle to be on the ground. He said God created the eagle to fly. God created the eagle to be on the tallest cliffs in the great Smoky Mountain National Park. And he said there they are. They are caught in that wilderness and they refuse to better themselves and to get up. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something tonight. There's a many a Christian tonight that's having a pity party. They are so weak now. They are so anemic. They've lost their power with God. They've forgotten how to pray. They've forgotten what door, which way the church door swings. They have forgotten how to read their Bible. They have forgotten how to win souls. And just maybe there's someone here tonight that's playing with the death, the sin unto death. Maybe God has dealt with you all he's going to deal with you. And God's going to take you to an early grave because you refuse to move out of the wilderness. And you're there. You refuse to listen to the chastening rod. You refuse to listen to the word of God. You refuse to repent. And ladies and gentlemen, you just may tonight be with those eagles in the wilderness nevermore to rise and fly again. Well, Brother Thompson said, well, I don't understand. He said, Tacoma, he said, why did those eagles down here? He said, why don't they get up and fly out of here? And old Tacoma said, well, he said, they were born to fly. He said, they're not born to this unnatural habitat. And he said, this unnatural habitat, my friend, has overtaken them. They've stayed too long. They've lost their power. Oh, my friends, tonight I can close my eyes. My mind can run wild for a few minutes. And I can think in the last four years, in, in April, just a couple of months away, in April, five years ago, we began having prayer meetings. And my friends, I remember those first prayer meetings. We started studying the book of, of Nehemiah. And as we began to pray, we 
we begin to seek God's will. We begin to study verse by verse what God did from Nehemiah and the vision that God gave Nehemiah. Oh, my friends, from that first time, I can remember and I can think in my mind and I can see many a soul that's walked through our little storefront building. I can see many a soul that's walked through the doors of this church right here. And my friends, as I look at them, I say, Dear God, where are they? And it just seems like the sweet Holy Spirit answers back. A lot of them's caught in the wilderness. A lot's caught in the wilderness, my friend. They're not willing to march to the tune of God's holy word. They're not willing to march to the tune of separation. They're not willing to soar, my friend, with the power of the Holy Spirit in a soul-winning church. They're not willing to take the Bible and let it to be the road map. And my friend, they're just like these little eagles and they're caught. They're called in the wilderness of sin. They're caught in the wilderness of liberality. They're caught in the wilderness of modernism. They're caught in the liberal liberality, my friend, of denominationalism and they're caught there and sad to say many of them are dying spiritually as they're there in that wilderness but I want you to notice these eagles the old Tacoma told Brother Thompson he said Brother Thompson he said go over there and pick up one of those eagles Brother Thompson said oh no no he said I know the eagle he said I know his strength he said I'm not about to pick him up he said I don't have any, any uh, uh, steel mesh gloves he said oh you don't need it with those eagles he said they've lost their power he said, they have no power. He said, go over there and pick them up. Oh, dear God in heaven tonight, I wonder right here in this auditorium tonight, I wonder how many Christians at one time were avid soul winners and had the power of God and I could call on you or you could call on someone else or someone else could call on you and they'd say, oh, pray for me. And you knew those prayers were going up and you knew those prayers were going to be answered, but not so anymore. Why? Because you're in the wilderness and you refuse to get out of the wilderness and you're, you're satisfied with the filth and the smog of this world and you refuse to move up to God and, and you're corroded over with worldliness and pride and you refuse to move to the, to the to, and be submissive to the perfect will of God. Oh my friends as we see he walked over there and he said he picked up one of those eagles and he said he weighed about 40 pounds and he picked that eagle up and he couldn't even perch on his arm. He didn't have the strength to perch. He said, the old Indian told him, he said, preacher, look at its eyes. Look at its eyes. And he said, and then he turned that eagle around and he looked right straight into that beautiful eagle's eyes that should have been a beautiful bird. He said his wings were fluttered and, not, and a mess. He said his, his beak was all corroded over and he couldn't barely open his mouth, just a barely a little bit. He said his legs were swollen to where he couldn't even walk. And he said, said that they were just ready to burst out in, in, in hemorrhage. He said he was an awful mess. But he said, when I looked at his eyes, he said, then it told the story. He said, oh, Tacoma then interrupted. And he said, notice his eyes. He said, an eagle is meant to fly. He said, an eagle is meant to soar above the trees and above the cliffs and above the storms and above the clouds. But he said, an eagle is also supposed to cry. And he said, that eagle is in such a pity party. That eagle is so far away from what he's supposed to be, he can't even cry cry anymore. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. I said this morning, until Mr. Wet Eyes comes back into the church and t replaces old Mr. Dry Eyes, there's never going to be revival. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll study the eagle in it all, the healthy eagles are the ones that weep. The well -held wealthy eagles, the ones that's strong, the ones that's catching the prey, the ones that's building the nest, the ones that's courting the mates, the ones that's raising the babies, those strong eagles are the ones, my friend, that are look up into the face of the sun and into the face of God Almighty and tears will run down their beaks and drip off onto the rocks, my friend, because there's power in the tears of those that are weeping and crying and only those that are powerful with God are weepers tonight. My friends, and not too long ago, I had the privilege when I was down at the sword, I walked into John Rice's office. They've got his office back there sort of as a museum now. And it's a beautiful thing to see. And you look there and old John Rice's Bible is open there and Psalms 37. And my friends, you look there on his Bible and you know there's one thing there that caught my eyes. There's one thing. John Rice, listen to me. John Rice is my hero, my friends. If it were not for John Rice, I'd be a liberal tonight. If it were not for John Rice, I'd be dead and dried up somewhere in an old dried up Methodist 
this church with Ichabod written across the top of the door, never winning a soul to Christ. But I looked at his Bible, and one thing I learned about looking at John Rice's Bible, and I never thought about it until I was looking at these eagles' story. But my friend, old John Rice's Bible opened there to Psalms 37, and you know what it is about that Bible? The pages are wrinkled, and the pages are all matted together where he stood over his Bible and wept over his Bible, and tears has run down his old wrinkled face and dripped onto his Bible and almost destroyed those pages. My friends, listen to me. That old man's gone home to God. There's got to be somebody to carry on the heritage. There's got to be somebody that's going to do some weeping. There's got to be somebody that's going to do some crying and pleading with God, my friends, and you're not going to do it in the wilderness. You've got to get out of the wilderness and you've got to weep and you've got to cry. But Preacher Thompson said he picked up that eagle, said his eyes were as dry as powder. He said he looked at that eagle and all around his beautiful eyes where there was, once was so much power, where they had a microscopic vision that at 2,000 feet it could see a tiny rabbit nestling in the grass below. Those eyes now are weak and those eyes have a, a longing look in them. And he said that eagle hadn't cried for weeks. Oh, my friend, I wonder how many Christians, how long's it been since you've cried? You say, oh, preacher, what's so important about tears? Let me just show you. You don't need to turn. But my friend, in the book of Psalms, chapter 6, beginning in verse 6, the psalmist says this. Psalm of David. He says, I am weary with my groaning. All my night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. My eyes consume because of grief. It waxed all because of mine enemies. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weep. Thing. How long's it been since you've wept like that? And then on over in the scripture, Psalms 126, verses 5 and 6. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth in weeping, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. How did he do that? Because the tears. We can look over Acts chapter 20, verse 19. Paul says these words. The great apostle Paul, my preacher, your preacher, Paul says these words, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and wisdom. With many tears. He goes on. Chapter uh, 20 and verse 31. Paul says. I cease not to warn everyone. Day and night with tears. Listen ladies and gentlemen. What's wrong with our soul winning? What's wrong with our prophets? What's wrong with our preaching? What's wrong with our teaching? Excuse me. We forgot to cry. We forgot to weep. We forgot to beg God for the victory. Oh yes, we've got all the means, we've got all the methods, we've got all the promotions, we've got everything in the world we've, that man can dream up and concoctionate. But let me tell you something, one thing we forgot is the weeping before God. And ladies and gentlemen, till the tears comes back, there'll not be revival. Till the tears come back, there's not going to be people saved in our homes. Till the tears come back, there's not going to be people saved on the street. Till the tears come back, my friend, there's not going to be victory anywhere. Till Mr. Dry Eyes gets out of the pews and Mr. Wet Eyes gets back in them. Oh, my friends, you want to get God's attention? Pray and weep and cry. Oh, but preacher, I'm a big man. Yeah, the greatest man in the world, my friend, wept and cried, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. We say, oh, but you don't understand. If I cry, everybody will look down on me. God bless that turkey that looked down on you for weeping and crying. Weep and cry, and then bring forth the victory in precious souls to Jesus Christ. The eagle had forgotten to cry. He was in such a deep pity party. No, he didn't know how. My man, he had become a weakling because he didn't weep, because he didn't look up into the face of God and cry bitter tears. Brother Thompson said, Tacoma told him, he said, this is something we need to see. He got him by the arm and he said, move over here for these eagles' sake, preacher. And he said, dear God, I've done seen all I want to see. He said, no, you've got to see more. And he brought him over to a little pine thicket where he could see visibly those five eagles on the ground. He said he watched those eagles. And he said he heard rustling of wings above. And said they looked out around those pines and looked up and said there was those five well eagles. He said they were soaring over above. And now they could see that they had pieces of rabbit in their, in their talons and pieces of squirrel. 
in their talons. And maybe a chipmunk or two along the way in their talons. Maybe a quail. Maybe a mountain grouse. But they had meat, fresh meat in their talons. And he said, those old eagles, he said it got perfectly quiet. And he said they was not making any move or nothing. And he said every once in a while, one of those old eagles above would scream. And he said he'd make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. And he said that old eagle would swoop right down to the top of those trees. And he said within just a few feet of those five weak little eagles in that wilderness, he said they'd drop pieces of rabbit. He said, they'd drop pieces of squirrel. And he said, he said, he stood there and watched. And he said, two of those little, those eagles in that wilderness, he said, two of them, they looked and they saw that. And he said, those old eagles then soared back up. And he said, they screamed and they screamed and they screamed. And so that old Indian started taking a fit. He said, they just seemed to circle around in the sky up there. And the old eagle said, you see why my ancestors circled around the fire and praise God. And he said, what are you talking? about. He said those old eagles are up there saying, holy eagles in the wilderness. Take the meat. Take the meat. Take the meat. There's victory in the meat. There's power in the meat. Take the meat. Get out of the wilderness. I was there. I know you can get out. Praise God tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Take the meat. Take the meat. Take the meat. Praise God. There's victory in the meat of God's word. Glory to God. There's meat, my friends. Now listen. Two of those little eaglets, two of those eagles around their grown eagles, two of those eagles, they begin to hobnob, they begin to, to crawl, and they begin to flutter, and they got over there to those pieces of rabbit, they got over there to those pieces of squirrel, and you know what they did? They weren't even strong enough to stand up and eat it. They fell over. But they began to take their beak and they began to take just little tiny portions of that, of that meat that those eagles gave them. All the time, those old eagles were up above screaming at the top of their voice saying, take the meat, take the meat. Two of those little eagles began to eat of that meat. They ate just a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. They couldn't eat much. Their beaks wouldn't open. But three of them wouldn't eat at all. Oh, dear friends, I saw that. I couldn't help it. Tears came to my eyes. I couldn't help it. My heart began to ache. I couldn't help it. I began to praise God for those two that did eat. But wait a minute. Three of them didn't eat. Why? Those five above were doing everything in their power. They were doing everything that God had given them strength to do. They even caught the meat. They skinned the meat. They brought it in. They swooped down right on top of those eagles. And they dropped the meat to them. All they had to do was to open their beaks and start eating. But they wouldn't do it. Wait a minute. How many of you here tonight? Bring my lungs out for five years now. And you still just sit there cold, liturgical, and indifferent. The meat's given to you. It's laid right before you. But you won't pick it up and take it. You won't pick it up and take it. God bless you. I love every one of you. But I'm going to tell you something. I can't reach down and grab you. I can't take this Bible and cram it down your throat. I can't take the standards this Bible teaches and cram them down your throat. God bless you. I can take the standards that this Bible teaches and make you walk by them. If that's your beat, you're going to have to take it out yourself. Because you're going to die in wilderness. You're going to die in wilderness. God help us tonight, my friends. The meat's before us. But are we going to take it? The old Indian then, the old Indian Tacoma took the preacher. He said, Preacher, this is so sad. I want to show you something. Old Tacoma knew those eagles. He took him out through the through the woods a little bit farther there. And he went out there. I can't remember exactly. I believe there was 20 little crosses sticking up there. 20 little graves. And the preacher looked at him. And he said, Tacoma, what in God's name is this? He said, Preacher, this is 20 eagle graves because they wouldn't help themselves and they died in the wilderness. And he said, Preacher, if those other three back there don't start eating this week, he said, but by the week's end, he said, they're going to be buried right out there with the others, dead in the wilderness. Oh, my friends, listen to me tonight. Let the message of that eagle grip your heart. My friend, listen to me. We can't intravenously feed you. You're going to have to make that effort yourself, my friends, or you're going to die in the wilderness. You're going to die in the wilderness. 
All right. They flew over. My friend, they were still causing those others. But my friends, I want to tell you something else. Those eagles that died in that wilderness of Tacoma told Brother, Brother Thompson, he said, Brother Thompson, this will bless your heart. He said, Brother Thompson, he said, all of those eagles that died out there in that eagle graveyard, and he said, these three that's on the verge of death now, and the two that's trying to get their strength to fly out of this wilderness, he said, preacher, every one of them, he said, every day, they look toward the rock. They look toward the rock. Glory to God, my friend. They know where the victory is. It's in the rock. Glory to God. Listen to me. Why in the world do you want to walk with buzzards? Why in the world do you want to walk with chickens? Why in the world do you want to walk with all kinds of the filth of the world today, my friends? When you can soar with eagles. Glory to God. And that comes on the rock. On the rock. And he said something else, preacher. He said something else about those eagles. He said, those eagles that die, he said, every one of them die facing the rock. Let me tell you something, friend. If you're saved by the grace of God and you're out of the will of God, you ought to be facing that rock. What was it David did? David, my friend, went to his housetop. He turned facing the eastward toward Jerusalem and prayed pleading with God. My friend, he said, the Bible says, his face was as a flint toward Jerusalem. He was facing the rock. My friend, there's no way in this world, there's no way in this world, it's, it's totally impossible for the born-again Christian to sin and be happy in it. It's impossible. There's no way. You say, oh, preacher, that proves you're wrong because I am. No, no, no. You're not a born-again believer, my friend. You've gone through the role. You've born into hypocrisy. You've played the role. you put on the label of Baptist or something else. Ladies and gentlemen, you're not a son of God. You've been illegitimately grafted in, my friend. You might have the right answers. You may have the right book. You may have the right everything else. But, my friend, you've not got the right Savior. Once you get hold of the Savior, blessed be God, you may want to get away, but you can't because you're on the rock. On the rock. Glory to God, you're on the rock. Now listen, those old eagles that soared overhead, this blessed my heart. I tell you what, I've had a time. I've had a time with this message. I can't give you all of it, but I've had a time with it, I'm telling you. Those old eagles, they sailed around up there and they swerved, they swooped down. And you know what? They dropped meat in there to those other eagles. They gave those other eagles encouragement. But you know what? Not one of those eagles flying would go back into that wilderness. Not one of them. Why wouldn't they? Because they knew what was in that wilderness. They knew what was down there was going to tie them down. They knew what was down there was going to starve them to death. They knew what was down there was going to make their beaks corrode over. They knew what was down there was going to make their legs swell. They knew what was down there was going to make them couldn't breathe. They knew what was down there was going to slow their wind speed to 37 miles an hour or less. And they knew it was a long way back to the rock. So they wasn't going down there. You let me tell you something, Christian. You playing around these hell holes, you playing around these disco joints, you playing around with dope, you playing around with alcohol, you playing around with illicit sex, you playing around with homosexuality, excuse me, you're about to slip into the wilderness. You say, oh, I can handle it, yeah. That's what the little boy said when he was playing on the creek bank. I won't get wet, but directly he came home ringing wet because he slipped on a rock and fell in. And you'll do the same thing. You can't play with sin and not lose. I don't care who you are. And the greatest example of that, and I'll not go into it tonight, is King David. He played with it every way in the world, and it cost him. Read Psalms 51, and you'll see what it cost him. All through the years of David's, David's uh, uh, pleading for God to forgive him and everything else, David did not write one psalm. David did not do one thing great. And in Psalms 51, when you hear the brokenheartedness of King David, you still feel the agony of that sin. Forgiven! Yes, but he still had to reap his harvest. Oh, my friend, those old eagles soaring above, they knew what was down there. And they wasn't going. Preacher, can I do this? Yep, you sure can. But I'm going to tell you something. When you start playing around with that in that wilderness, you're asking to get caught by the talons of worldliness and pride in the wilderness and pull you down. Oh, my friends, we look at this eagle a little bit more. We can see these old eagles there 
they're in that wilderness, my friends. And then one of them, two of them, they begin to go. Brother Thompson had to leave. Old Tacoma kept tabs with those, those eagles. He said that sometime later he called him back. And he said, Preacher, he said, I want you to do something. He said, I want you to see this eagle. And he says, one of those little eagles that was in that wilderness. Oh, he couldn't fly, folks. He couldn't fly to the top of the cliff. He'd lost his power. But you know what he did? He kept eating little portions of that squirrel, little portions of that rabbit. And as he kept eating little pieces of that, you know what he did? He kept walking out of that wilderness. He kept walking, facing his rock. He kept getting closer and closer to that rock, flying to the first branch of a limb, then to another branch, and then a little bit higher and a little bit higher. Rest a while and a little bit higher. One day he got back to his rock. <laughs> got back on his rock. Glory to God. He got on his rock. And he got on his rock. Do you know what he did? He got up there and he started taking his talons like this and broke off all those old hardened pieces. You know how you let your fingernails grow out? You don't get enough protein in your body, in your system. Your fingernails get hard, not clear, not pretty. They get hard and brickly. That's the way that eagle's talons has got. He began to break them off on that rock. And as he began to break them off, his legs began to bleed. As they began to bleed, my friend, that infection began to ooze out through those, in, through those in, uh, claws. And then you know what he did? He'd back up and he'd run headlong into that rock. <laughs> into that rock. He was breaking all that calcium built up off of his beak. And he was breaking the pieces out of his little nostril so he could breathe. He was breaking everything, my friend, that hindered him. And my friend, as he did, then that eagle, he was there. Brother old Tacoma told Brother Thompson, he said, oh, Brother Thompson, he said, it's a blessing. I want you to see something. He said, now his talons are strong and now his beak is ready to open and he can scream and he can fly and he can breathe normal. But I want you to see something. Took him back over there. He'd set up a high-powered telescope. And he zeroed in. He said, Tacoma, how do you know that's that same eagle? He said, I know what Rocky's born on. <laughs> Glory to God. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something tonight. I want to tell you something. Are you listening? I want to tell you something. You don't have to worry about what I believe, my friend, because my foot's on the rock and my mind's made up. Praise God. I believe in Jesus tonight. I believe in salvation by grace through faith. I don't believe in works. I don't believe in hanging on, holding on, hope so much, so or maybe so. I believe my Jesus is sufficient for it all. My friends, I got my foot on the rock. You don't have to worry about me getting caught up in pulpry. You don't have to worry about me by being a Jehovah's false witness. You don't have to worry about me being a Methodist or a Presbyterian or a Pentecostal. Praise God. I know where my rock's at. And my friend, I'm going to stay on the rock. I ain't getting off of it. Because I like the rock. It's sweet. And I'm not leaving it. But wait a minute. Oh, he zeroed that telescope in on that old eagle. And you know what that eagle was doing? I talked about a minute ago. That eagle was sitting there on the edge of that rock. Now listen to this. He's just been in that wilderness now. He's through much pain and suffering. He's very weak. He's worked his way. It's taken him a long time, but he's got back to his rock. <laughs> he's sitting on that rock. And you know what that eagle's doing? Brother Thompson said, I looked in there. And he said, I looked through that telescope. And he said it wasn't long till tears had filled the eye socket of that telescope. And I couldn't see the eagle. He said, bless my heart. He said, I got to watching that little eagle. And said he was standing there looking right straight up into the sun. And he said directly, he said tears begin to swell up. He said, just look like I could reach out there and touch him. He said directly tears begin to swell up in that little eagle's dry eyes. And he said those tears begin to flow. And he said those tears, glory to God, just rolled off his face, off his beak, dripped down on his rock. He said directly, he spread his wings, just looked up in the face of God, and tears just rolled down his face, down on his breast, and wet his breast. And he continued to cry, and he continued to flap his wings, and said directly, that little eagle went, Aah! And he flew, fell off over, and he sailed down through that canyon, and he caught a wind, and he said he sailed right straight up toward the sun, and, and shining right straight in the sun, and said that old Indian done a war dance. And he said, praise God, preacher. You know what that old eagle's doing? And he said, no. He said, I'm saying glory to God. I'm out of the wilderness. I'm out of the wilderness. 
Glory to God, I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Glory to God, ladies and gentlemen, we got some backsliders that need to get redeemed. They need to break the clutches of worldliness and pride. Need to shed some old-fashioned tears. Need to look back right straight in the face of Jesus and scream, Glory to God, I've been redeemed. Glory to God. Oh, my friends, if we look at that eagle, he soars around. And Coma said you could hear him scream. And then that eagle thinks of something else. He said that eagle then, he said it's amazing to watch him. He said that eagle then will go into his hunt sail and he'll start sailing around. He said the first thing you know, he's caught him a squirrel. He said he'll take that squirrel back to his rock. He said he'll eat part of that squirrel. He'll tear off portions of meat, big hunks of that squirrel. You know what he does? He picks it up in his talons, falls off that rock again, soars back. You know where he's going? Back to the wilderness. You know what he's doing? He's remembered that it wasn't for those powerful, healthy eagles delivering him food and encouragement in that wilderness, he'd have died in that wilderness. And he sails back to that wilderness and he begins to scream with those other five eagles. And he swoops right down to those treetops. And he says, get up, brother eagles. Get up, brother eagles. Get up, brother eagles. Eat the meat. Eat the meat. Eat the meat. There's victory in the meat. Get on back to the rock. Get up. You can do it. You can do it. And then that eagle begins to encourage the others, dropping meat in there then. Glory to God, my friends. You and I tonight, we ought to be ashamed. We ought to hang our heads in, in sorrow and shameless tonight. When we look at our brethren that's all around us that are falling by the wayside and we refuse to go to them. We refuse to encourage them. We refuse to, to do everything in our power to get them to eat the meat and get back right with God. Oh, my friends, such a lesson in those birds. I want to share with you five things right quick hurriedly tonight on wildernesses, wildernesses that you and I ought to avoid. And I'm done tonight. Oh, my friends, all oh, these eagles, they bless my soul. I could go on for another hour, but I'm about to give out. And I want to share five things with you. I want you to notice tonight, we need to be careful. We need to be so aware of the wilderness of unconfessed sin. The wilderness of unconfessed sin. Oh, my friend, back in Death Valley days, as pilgrims were making their way to California, they went through Death Valley, which is still there today. They tell me that in some sandstorms and stuff there in Death Valley now, you'll still see an old a covered wagon wheel, maybe the hoop of a covered wagon, maybe the skull of an old cow or a horse that's been caught there in Death Valley and died. Oh, my friends, listen to me. There's so many that's caught in Death Valley because of unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sin holds them there. Proverbs 28 and 13, uh, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth them shall have mercy. Hey, wait a minute, folks. I'm not talking about shoveling. And what are you talking about, preacher? You know, many times a preacher preaches, and you know what we want to do? We want to sit right here on this front row. And I want to look back and say, Billy, this is for you, son. Shan, this is for you. Jimmy, this is for you. This is for you. And we're so busy shoveling it across our shoulders, we don't let it penetrate into our old souls. But let me tell you something, folks. If you're here tonight with unconfessed sin in your life, you're advertising for Death Valley. You're advertising for Death Valley. I'm not talking about shoveling it over your shoulders. I'm starting with me. Unconfessed sin is killing every one of us and tying us to the ground. Unconfessed. We need to get it right with God. We need to break that, break that build up loose and we need to get on our face before God and run Mr. Dries off and weep our way back to getting right with God. My friend, until that happens, there'll never be a revival. It'll never happen. Wait a minute. There's another wilderness. The wilderness of missed opportunities or unused opportunities. Did you ever stop to think? Maybe, I, I know... I have to move around a lot. I see a lot of people. And every once in a while I just stop and think, Dear God, how, how many people have I passed today? How many opportunities have I given up and that person will die and go to hell because I didn't tell them about Jesus? You say, Oh, preacher, that's different for me. No, it isn't. You just won't admit it. It's the only difference. 
It's the only difference. Oh, yes, we can, we can talk our jobs. Oh, yes, we can talk our jobs till we're blue in the face. But we can't tell that old wretched sinner about the love of Jesus Christ. Friend, that's, un, that's, un, un, that's not accepting the opportunities that God's given us. Caught in the wilderness. Caught in the wilderness. Carl Hatch. I, God bless him. I'll never forget. I believe Brother Ron. Brother Ron blamed one. I don't remember which one it was. With us, we was driving over on, where was we? Going up off of, uh, coming down on Highland Avenue, coming around down to Depot Street. Carl Hatch was driving along. I didn't see anybody. I promise, I didn't see anybody. Just all of a sudden, he said, stop, stop. Scared me. I thought I'd done run over somebody or something. I locked it down right there in the middle of the road. You know what he said? He said, let me out, let me out. I said, Carl, where are you going? He said, let me out, let me out. You're crazy. I let him out. He went running up the street. I said, he saw somebody up there. You know what? About three minutes, here he come. Here he come. Had a smile big as Texas. Come walking down the street. You know what? Had an old man by the arm, about 64 or 5 years old. Was that you, Ron, with me? No. Had about a 64 or 5 year old man. He come walking down the street. Tell these boys what you did. Just now did. The old boy said, got saved. Got saved. Hey, man, folks, listen. We was going to hunt somebody. And we run over a man dying and going to hell, going to hunt somebody to witness to. And Carl won him. You know what he said? He preached at pastor school two years ago, wasn't it, Brother Ron? Or three? When he was up there, he preached at pastor school about him sitting one time going soul winning and got directions. You know, the South, we give directions. Uh, Brother Al King used to laugh at me all the time. I'd say, well, you go down here to, to so-and-so and you turn right and go out there just a little ways and turn back to the left and... He'd say, now wait a minute, now wait a minute. I don't know where little ways is at, and I don't know where that's at. And, but you know, Brother Hatch said he was going out to, to give him directions to go to this man's house. And the old boy said, well, you go down here to a big oak tree, and you turn left right there at that big oak tree, and you go out there till you see a little red house on the right, and you turn left right there, and you go up there till you see a barn on the left and, or on the right, and then you turn right, and the, little man, the man lives up there. He said, I went out there, I said, I, everywhere I looked is oak trees. Said directly, I stopped to get out to see where this man lived, get directions to his house, and went up and knocked on the man's door. Said, hey, can you tell me where so-and-so lived? And he said, yeah. Began to tell him. He said, well, what, by the way, he said, are you saved? He said, no, I'm not. Led him to the Lord. He said, time he found that man that he was hunting for, he'd won 37 souls to Jesus Christ. He was taking advantage of the opportunities. How many people do you and I walk by every day that's going to go to hell because we didn't tell them about Jesus? We're caught in the wilderness. What wilderness are we caught in? Pride. Pride. We're ashamed. We're ashamed. Our pride. Now, don't you bow your head, as Brother Hatch says. And I ain't ready to pray. We're afraid somebody will see us down on Depot Street witnessing one of them old drunks down there. Now, if you wasn't too proud tonight, you'd say Amen to that. You're ashamed, and some of you's afraid to go soul winning on Thursday night because you're afraid that we'll knock on somebody's door and you work with them and they hear you tell the dirty jokes and hear you cuss and hear you and see you live like hell all week and you're afraid that you'll knock on their door by mistake. That's why you're caught in the wilderness. Hey, friends, that eagle, you know what he does? He works those talons on his rock. Why don't you get the book? Confess those sins and work your claws in God's Word. Get the pride put behind you. Pride, pride goes before destruction. The Holy Spirit before fall. Why don't you clean your vision up a little bit by the Word of God? Why don't you clean your life up a little bit by the mirror of God's Holy Word? And then, praise God, you can go out there and face the devil. Point your finger right under his nose and say, Bless God, if you don't get saved, you're going to go to hell. My friends, you've got to be clean before you do that. You've got to be clean before you do that. The wilderness has caught us. Let's look on right quick. The wilderness of an undedicated walk. The wilderness of an undedicated walk. Oh, my friends, listen. When we get out of the will of God, we don't walk with God. When we get out of the will of God, we quit reading. When we get out of the will of God, my friends... There's no way in this world that we can have the power again till we get back on the face before God and dedicate our lives anew and fresh to the Lord Jesus. Oh, we want to live. We want to live every way in the world and, and we want to have one foot in society and one foot in separation. Oh, I, I know. I know. You ladies, God bless you. I'm going to jump them in just in a minute. So just hold on and then you can say amen too, all right?
You ladies, I know, listen, I'm no fool. I, I tried to buy Christine a dress the other day. You know what? I saw the hem lines up above the knee. I didn't buy the stinking thing. I ain't buying it. If you don't cover a knee, I ain't buying it. Do you know what some of you will? You'll buy it before this year's over. And you know what your excuse is going to be? You don't, you don't give a hoot what this Bible says about the woman covering her thighs. You don't care what it says. You know what you'll do? Well, I can't find anything that fits me just right. And it's got to be above my knee. Why don't you? Sister Sandy's a good seamstress. Sandy, I'll give you a plug. She can sew you clothes and make them to cover your knees, ladies. Chicken, say amen now the wilderness of an undedicated walk. Now you men, now. Now you like, now let's see how much you want to snigger. Some of you men don't even, some of you boys don't even have sense enough to tie your shoes. Come on. Thank God the pants legs have got big enough, but you know what you boys are doing? You're making them look so baggy they're trashy in the first place. And then you go out and you bow them up like this or put <laughs> pull, pull your breeches legs up, roll one up and one down, and you know you look like a turkey. <laughs> Listen, folks, if I was lost and dying and going to hell, and somebody come to my door, now don't get mad at me now, you know I'm right, down deep in your heart you know I'm right, but if I open my door, and somebody was standing in my door with their shoes not tied, I don't want to listen to nothing they've got to say. But you know what I've come to the conclusion of, Shannon Brad? <laughs> I've come to the conclusion you don't tie your shoes because you don't know how. <laughs> so we're going to have a shoe tying class starting next week. Folks, what I'm saying is this. Your appearance says everything in the world about this Bible. We, we, don't, we don't make to-do around here about clothes. <whistles> Boy, this. <whistles> we don't make to-do around here about clothes, but I wouldn't come to church dressed like some of you come. Amen, preacher. Come on, son. Don't let down. I ain't going to church. You come to church looking like you've just been cleaning the barn out. And the tragedy is that if that's all you've got to wear, God bless your heart. But wait a minute, that's not the case. You've got better threads hanging in your closet than I have. But you don't wear them because it 